ASP.NET Core provides excellent support for routing inside of the application. But what if you want to route to a bunch of different applications? Hmm, let's match on that. Hi everybody, and welcome to another solo episode of the ASP.NET Monsters. In today's episode, I wanted to talk a little bit about YARP. Uh, so what's YARP and why does it sound so weird? Well, I'm glad that you asked that, Simon. The answer is that YARP is yet another proxy. So you may be familiar with other HTTP proxies uh, like Nginx, and that is a fantastic tool, and it's certainly something that I have used over the years. But Microsoft have discovered that there are a lot of groups inside of Microsoft itself that are looking to either leverage reverse proxies or use their own or do something kind of more on the .NET side than you would get with Nginx. So they have produced this fantastic little tool called YARP. Um, so this is basically just a library that plugs into uh, the ASP.NET pipeline and allows you to proxy requests out to other places, to do load balancing, uh, to do all sorts of interesting things. So let's throw a scenario out there and we will use YARP to solve it. Uh, so one of the big things that you see when you're versioning APIs is that ideally you wanna keep APIs versioned the same. So you wanna keep the messages that they return the same so that you can push people against the latest API or three APIs ago and it doesn't really matter. Like you'll you be able to get newer, better features in the new versions but people who are using older clients should still be able to look at the new API without breaking it. That's ideal, but it's not always possible. Uh, so one of the things that I have seen people do is to use a V1, V2 API. So we have a scenario like that right here inside of our application. Uh, so we have two pretty simple ASP.NET core applications here. And in fact, they are the default applications that just return weather forecasts. Uh, but we need to version it up here. So this is what version two returns as a contract. Uh, so it has a, a date, a temperature in centigrade, a temperature in Fahrenheit, a temperature in Kelvin, and a summary. And version one returns much the same thing, but you see that we're missing that temperature in Kelvin. Now this is the ideal scenario where if you fire a V1 request against V2, you're gonna get back something that satisfies your contract. You'll get an extra field, but you'll still be able to utilize everything here. However, we're gonna introduce a breaking change here, and we're gonna get rid of temperature in Fahrenheit because that's not even like a real measurement system. Uh, so instead, we're just gonna return temperature in centigrade and in Kelvin, and that's gonna define version one, version two of our API. There's a ton of places you might want to use this. Uh, one of the places that I'm running into it at the moment is that I have version one of an API, which is written in .NET full framework, a pretty ancient version of .NET full framework. And it's actually um, written using MVC four, I think. Uh, and then I have a newer version that I want to stand up in full .NET core, but I want to have the same sort of URL for them with just a V1 and a V2, even though they're gonna to go to two separate applications, which are probably gonna be running on two different servers. Uh, so what we can do is we can create another project here, and I've just called mine proxy demo because I'm not particularly creative. Uh, and inside of this proxy demo here, we have created uh, a reference, first of all, to to Microsoft reverse proxy. And then we're just gonna set up a pretty simple looking configuration here. Uh, so we're just gonna assign the configuration to a variable here called configuration. Uh, we're gonna configure services. So we're gonna add reverse proxy here, and we're going to load the configuration from a section inside of our configuration file. Again, creatively called reverse proxy. Uh, and here I have just thrown a breakpoint in and I have commented out the if development stuff so I could intercept any developer exceptions here. Uh, we're gonna use routing and we're gonna use this map reverse proxy 
for the endpoints here. So let's go and take a quick look at what our app settings file looks like. Uh, so up here is the logging section. I've turned everything on to trace so that we can take a look at what comes out of here. Uh, but this is the interesting part here is the reverse proxy area here. So what I've done is I have defined a couple of different routes inside of this application. So the first route is the V1 route. So that is gonna redirect anybody who goes to our application slash V1 to weather forecast, uh, or the, sorry, the, anything that matches this path here is gonna be routed to cluster one. And then anything that matches this path here is gonna be routed to cluster two. And I have also removed the prefixes here. So our applications that we have developed one and two over here, uh, they don't need to be aware of the fact that they are v1 or v2 or anything like that. So if you have a legacy code base like I have, I don't have to go in and make any routing changes to that. I can just deploy it as is. Uh, so this transform is just gonna strip the v1 off the front of that. Uh, and equally, I'm gonna strip the v2 off the front of that. If we don't have this transform in there, uh, then it's gonna append this path to the, the application and we don't necessarily want that. We just want it to have like this part of the path appended to it when it sends a request to the, the application that's being proxied. Uh, so let me go and start that up. So what I have here is I have thing to proxy one running here. And I have thing to proxy two running here. And then over here, I have gonna start up my application here. So I've just asked it to run on port 5007. Thing one is on 5005, thing two is on 5006. Uh, so we'll kick that off here. And like I said, I have significant debugging added here. So if we take a look at what gets added here, you can see that routes v1 and v2 have been added. So let's go and throw a request against that here. So what I have here is going to make a request to the v1 endpoint. So if I hit that, you can see that I get back what is v1 data. We have a temperature in Fahrenheit in here, and we don't have any sort of temperature in Kelvin. Let's go and take a look at what that looked like on the back end here. Uh, so that request started out somewhere around here. Uh, so what we've done is we've gone through, we've found the various different routes that might match this. So in this case, only the V1 route matches it. So we're gonna execute the V1 endpoint uh, and we stripped off the front of that. So it's going to proxy the request through here to port 5005 weather forecasts. Uh, and that looks pretty nice. So it's finished the execution. It's returned all the data to me and it's done it in like 100 milliseconds. So that I think counts the time that it took me to serve the actual request. So let's try the V2 endpoint now. Uh, so you can see V2 is being fired here. I must not have recompiled this because I still have temperature in Fahrenheit but we'll just pretend that that's missing. Uh, but we do also have temperature and Kelvin here. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll go and recompile that just so that we know that we've done a good job. All right, hopefully that actually recompiled. There we go. Uh, so yeah, we've lost our temperature in Fahrenheit. So we still have temperature in centigrade and temperature in Kelvin. Uh, but now we're able to get this just off of the same host name. So this could proxy, I mean, right now this is just proxying to a different port on the same machine. It could proxy to another machine. Uh, it could proxy all over the place. Uh, and there's a bunch of different rules, which I'm not gonna get into in this episode, but maybe I'll get into in a follow-up episode related to load balancing here. Uh, we can do things like cores and SSL termination and all those sorts of fun things. Uh, we can do those all in here. So I will revisit that in the next episode. But until then, uh, YARP is a powerful new tool. It is still pretty early in the development cycle, so I would not necessarily recommend using it in production, especially if production is important to you. Uh, but the documentation is all available here. I'll put a link uh, here and of course with being the new Microsoft everything is being developed in the open uh, so there's fairly decent documentation for it 
um, some limited articles starting off, but this is like preview three that I'm running right now. Uh, so there's going to be a lot more work done on this in the future, especially before it goes live. So if anybody's interested in more, we're going to have more episodes on this. So remember to like, comment, and share, and we'll see everybody on next week's episode. Bye.